If you become a patron of Unregistered by going to patreon.com slash unregistered, you can get access to bonus content like bonus episodes of Unregistered. We're now putting roughly half the episodes behind the Patreon paywall. Also, there's my regular news analysis show called Unreported, regular Ask Me Anything shows, Unregistered Live, which is my live Thursday night meetings, which is very fun, with patrons. And then, if you're at the Unregistered Academy level, that tier of Patreon, you get access to all our new courses. We had a course on the religious right, and just concluded, and upcoming, I will be teaching my World War II, The Great Blowback. All those courses will be free. Also, sorry, there's a history of NATO with Scott Ritter and James Carden as well. All these courses are for free for members of the Unregistered Academy at patreon.com slash unregistered. I hope to see you in class. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. My guest this week is a historian of the United States whose work is so important and would so profoundly change our understanding of the American past that he has been systematically ignored by the professional historians who control my field. But the good news is, I have a podcast, so I get to make his history known to everyone. This is my interview with David Beto. I am joined from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, by David Beto, who is, in my opinion, the most underrated historian in the United States of America and has been for decades because, David, you have written many books that I refer to, I would say, every week I bring up one of your books. I tell people about them and no one knows about you. <laughs> the historical profession that you and I belong to, you have been ignored by it. When I was at Columbia in graduate school, your name never came up. Your name never came up when I was a professor for 25 years teaching history at various universities. And yet throughout that, I continually brought up your books about mutual aid societies, about TRM Howard, um, about the tax revolts during the New Deal in the 1930s. These are books that, are, that present arguments with overwhelming amount, amount of evidence that you simply will not see in our field, in a U.S. history, in the historiography. They ignore you and your arguments and your books. Why? Because of your politics. You have the wrong politics, sir. I think that that has something to do with it. Um, my first book was on tax revolts. And, uh, you know, this is a book saying there's this mass movement during the Great Depression of people that want to cut government spending and don't want to pay taxes. Right. And I, you know, people, it got published, but it didn't really get picked up. And I think it went against the narrative. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is the 1930s is the time of, of, of the New Deal, of the march towards the inevitable march to the New Deal, essentially. Um, and part of my argument was it wasn't so inevitable. You know, um, Roosevelt did not run as a New Deal candidate in 1932 at all. 
Um, the, the, the Socialist Party, the Communist Party did not do very well. Um, um, and that is sort of the view that it's a march toward in this direction. You have labor unions, you have farm tenant organizations, you certainly have all of this stuff going on. But here's this mass movement that at the deepest part of the depression is promoting very much a, a kind of different agenda. Um, so I think that that book, I was ahead of the curve in some ways on that book too, because there was a literature about 10 years after that, maybe a little less than that, on the history of conservatism. Mm -hmm. And I guess you could say that my people were conservatives in some sense, some of them were, but I got a little ahead of that curve. So I wasn't able to tap into that. And I kind of came at a time, and it's still a time now, where FDR is a hero, where things are going in a certain direction. The narrative is playing out, and this disrupts the narrative, I think. Yeah. So let's talk about the place of Franklin Roosevelt in our world. I mean, among historians, U.S. historians are overwhelmingly liberal and overwhelmingly proponents, supporters, enthusiasts about the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. And many people who are activists today who are liberals call for a return, a renewal of the New Deal. We have the Green New Deal as just one example. But, you know, you'll, it's hard to listen to Bernie Sanders or AOC or someone like that for very long without hearing Roosevelt mentioned. They want to return to what they imagine was the Roosevelt presidency and the New Deal, the politics of that and, those, and that time. Your work, and I would, I'd like to say some of my work too, but especially your work, drives a truck right through that narrative. And it presents, or I would say it shows, many elements of Roosevelt's presidency and his character and his politics and the New Deal that I think would be horrifying to anyone with any liberal sensibilities at all. And you're working on a new book about civil liberties under Roosevelt and the New Deal that is going to, <laughs> that is going to be a real problem for those calling for a new New Deal. But let's talk about, let's just talk about first about Franklin Roosevelt and how people think of him, and in particular, how US historians think of him. There's a monument to him on the Washington Mall consistently historians are asked in a survey, I think it's every year, right? They're asked to rank the presidents mm -hmm. and he is consistently in the top five. And I think often he's the top one, but he's always at the top. Liberals and academic liberals and historians love him, right? And they love him. And not only that, all is forgiven and explained away. So you're not going to find many historians left that will actually defend you know, the morality of the Japanese internment. However, um, the standard argument they make is to excuse him. Like, uh, oh, this is all because of uh, underlings like General DeWitt. And they'll quote DeWitt, in, in, who, who basically was against internment longer or for for a, a longer time than, I mean, basically he was against internment, internment when FDR was for it. So I'm not, you know, defending DeWitt. I think he was a racist and all that, a bureaucrat, kind of a humorless guy. But they'll blame it on these, uh, you know, the, the West Coast military commander. That's who DeWitt was or other people like that. And they excuse Roosevelt and they portray him as a victim of events. Um, um, he was taken up by the hysteria of the time. He's a sensible guy, though. And um, it was an aberration. That is how it's treated. And I looked mm -hmm. at all the main history textbooks I could find, and that pretty much is the view. Mm -hmm. It's like shift the blame, portray it as a kind of aberration, put the blame on underlings. And that is the greatest crime of any president uh, against American citizens, mm -hmm. certainly against American mm -hmm. citizens in American history. Mm -hmm. There's nothing even close to that because this, this is a crime against American citizens. Um, and their rights under the Bill of Rights, um, but it's forgiven. It's yeah. it's it's not forgiven, but it's overlooked. And there are things like that that uh, you know his civil rights record. 
um, there's a tendency to overlook that look that too. Uh, we could have had an anti-lynching bill had FDR used his influence, but instead, if anything, he used his influence in the opposite direction. He ceded control of Congress to a bunch of Jim Crow senators, for example. Mm-hmm. We go on and on, turning away the ship of Jewish refugees. Yes. FDR suddenly becomes helpless when it comes to anything like that. But he is a master innovator at cutting red tape and getting his way and overcoming obstacles when it comes to the New Deal. But when it comes to things like this, suddenly the excuses are all, you know, on display. So, I mean, there's some things I've noticed about him. And he's very charming Mm -hmm. in a way, although I find the charm rubs me the wrong way, always did. But he's got charisma Mm -hmm. um, and he's got a sense of humor. Um, He's witty. Um, and, and, and people are attracted to that aspect of him as well, I think. And they, and that makes them forgive things. Right. Yeah. The, you know, the internment of the Japanese by him is the one thing I think that most Americans are aware of as a great crime, but they almost, when they talk, have you noticed this, when they talk about it, Roosevelt's not mentioned. He, he's not part of the story. He's never part of the story of Japanese internment, right? He's just not mentioned. It just, it just happened. The government the United States government interned the Japanese, but Roosevelt is not a part of that narrative. Roosevelt, the opposite, of course, is true. Roosevelt's not only a part of it, he is the initiator. Roosevelt okay. supported internment of Japanese Americans in case of war as early as 1935. Spent a lot of time on the issue. Mm. Um, he pushed it. He had opposition. He had his attorney general was against it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, of all people, was against this. You got the two main people in the Justice <laughs> Department uh, were against it. And you could find a whole, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the names here, people like Secretary of Interior Ickes. You could find a whole bunch of people that were key people around Roosevelt, some new dealers and so forth, that were against this. But somehow he is carried away by events. Um and to that argument that there's this anti-Japanese hysteria, it's mostly con- it's confined mostly to the West Coast mm-hmm. and really just mostly the Los Angeles area, really, Southern California. Um, it, it is it is not this pervasive thing. And to the extent it's building and existing, FDR could have used his amazing charisma, and he did have amazing charisma, to simply speak up for Japanese Americans mm-hmm. after Pearl Harbor. In the three months, he could have made a statement. They're loyal. Leave them off. You know, don't don't bother them. People would have gone along with it. People mm-hmm. are willing to support anything he wanted at that point. He mm-hmm. never said a word. Yep, which says a lot about him. Yep, and I'll tell you. Yeah. I'll tell you more. I, we I told you a little bit about this before we started recording. So my research for my upcoming book on the history of U.S. foreign relations includes a very deep biography of Roosevelt, going all the way back to his childhood. And I found out that when he was in prep school, meaning high school, meaning he was 15 and 16 years old, he was reading books by Admiral Mahan, very famous uh, mm-hmm. military strategist who wrote all these books that the elite was reading in the late 19th century. And Mahan said, listen, the whole problem in the world for the United States is Japan. We've got to remove Japan as a force from the Pacific so that we can t- take over the Pacific. And Franklin Roosevelt, as a teenager, loved these books and talked incessantly about the evil Japanese and the need to remove them as a power, as a force, as a rival in the Pacific. This is in the 1890s when Franklin Roosevelt is literally still a child. Then in the 1920s, he wrote a column for a newspaper in Georgia in which he just laid out this racialist argument about how the Japanese are biologically inferior as a race of people and should be expelled from the country. Then, then his fair, I don't know if you know this, his very first cabinet meeting when after he takes office, his very first cabinet meeting, he he lays out plans, specific plans for a war with Japan. And this is in 1933. The very I was first not aware meeting. of that. That's, yeah. yeah. And, and the cabinet and there's uh, Rexford Tugwell, who was one of his main advisors, wrote about this, how he was horrified. He was horrified that the first thing that Roosevelt wanted to do as president was go to war with Japan. The first thing before the New Deal was even an idea for him. So this guy has got a long history of hating the Japanese. So his internment of them during war should not have been surprising to anyone who knew his history. 
And we have evidence of that racism in World War II yeah. in a very direct sense. He was he was into this view that, uh, oh, the Japanese had different. Uh, I forget what it was, but they, they, the skull size is different. He mm -hmm. used to do imitations of, of the Japanese accent. That said that they are a very treacherous people, you know, and, you know, oh, wow. entertain people with this kind of thing. But he was he was very much in eugenics, uh, um, mm -hmm. you know, during you know during the war, um, mm -hmm. and linked it to the to the Japanese, um, oh, yeah. and um, um, so th these views continue, and even when it's not even considered politically incorrect, it's not considered politically incorrect anymore by 1944 to refer to the internment camps, which I call concentration camps in my book because I of think course. I called them that. He's still using that terminology to describe them. Is, oh, yeah. is in 1944, he's still calling them concentration camps. Oh, yeah. Even though one that even his advisors are all trying to push in a different direction. Right. So his policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis Japanese Americans, again, that's known. And, you know, people don't like it when they find out that Roosevelt was behind it, although they're usually not told that it was Roosevelt who did it. It's amazing. But um, I mean, I've seen, you know, there's movies like uh, Farewell to Manzanar was like an old movie in the 70s or 80s about about the internment camps. I don't think Roosevelt made an appearance. I don't think he was mentioned. So but anyway, they do know that he interned the Japanese and they don't like that when they find out about it. But here's the thing. There is so much more. So, so, so much more about that man's career as a politician and as president that you and I have been interested in and have been talking about and, and exposing that, as I said, would horrify, horrify deeply anyone with any reasonable liberal sensibilities. So let's talk about, first of all, let me say he, one what, more thing about sure. that real quickly. Sure. Uh, the tendency to by liberals to cover for Roosevelt, liberals who were not comfortable with internment, go, you can find it in World War II. You can find it in the various decisions of the Supreme Court. If you right. look at those decisions, including right. the decisions that, that actually upheld the, you know, habeas corpus rights of Japanese Americans, which was, I think, almost a unanimous decision. That was a it, it was meaningless because it would all happened already. But you look at these various decisions. FDR's name is kept out of it, except huh. one person. And that is Justice Roberts, the or older, the swing voter. Roberts, by the end of the war, becomes much more of the kind of old Roberts. You know, let's let's you know, let's strike down some of this, you know, executive overreach. And right. he has a great line in one of his concurring opinions trying to strike down a anti-Japanese provision saying, you guys aren't blaming Roosevelt. He's the guy that did. You no, know, he, he doesn't exactly say that, but it's clear that's what he's saying. Right. So even then, if you look at those dissents, they're covering for him, which is really quite revealing. It is remarkable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, so your first book, Taxpayers in Revolt, you know, th that that um, just overturned the dominant narrative about Roosevelt, that he was enormously popular. Now, he was elected four times and by landslides, essentially, you know, although there was significant number of votes for his opponents in each election. But. But, you know, it's 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 generally believed, I think, and it's taught in history classes that he was an enormously popular president, maybe the most popular of all time. And that he not only that, he he oversaw the realignment of the parties, you know, so that now you have the ethnic working class and you have African-Americans shifting en masse into the Democratic Party because of Franklin Roosevelt. He was that popular. But taxpayers in revolt tells a totally different story. It tells the story of ordinary people who were not down with the program. Can you just can you uh, tell what you found in writing that book? Well, my my I'm showing my libertarian prejudices, but I always you know was interested in the issue of taxes. I mean, the American Revolution was a tax revolt in many ways, right? right. I thought, well, OK, what was going on at their points in history? And someone told me about this, showed me this article from a uh, I guess it was a municipal publication of municipal workers, and they were like hyperbolic about taxpayers are revolting everywhere. They have these mass demonstrations. I looked more into it, and there was all this, all these tax revolts beginning about 1931, continuing on until the early New Deal period. And these were local, right? Mm -hmm. Where most of the taxes were paid, uh, property taxes for the most part, uh, taxes on land. 
uh, specifically because there were different kinds of property taxes. And so people are resisting and there is a tax strike in Chicago that goes on for like two years where they're actually able to shut down uh, tax collection in the city of Chicago. <laughs> it's amazing. There's a mass movement. It's like 30,000 people are dues paying members of this tax revolt organization in Chicago and they're refusing to pay taxes um, um, unless certain demands are met about, you know, reductions and so forth. Um, so these people are, you know, doing these tax revolts. They're, the language is very familiar. You know, the Tea Party era, I guess you could say they're calling for budget cuts. They're calling for, uh, you know, they're talking about wastrels and the bureaucracy. They're saying things like, well, we've got to eliminate the public schools. Maybe the kids will learn something useful at home. You know, saying stuff like that. So you have that kind of sentiment out there. I'm not saying it was well thought out necessarily. It's a populist movement. But you have taxpayers leagues everywhere in the country. And they are pushing an agenda, which is very different. And even Roosevelt, to some extent, is pushing that agenda. If hmm. people here want to read that, Roosevelt is, you know, contradictory character in 1932. But he gives this incredible speech in Pittsburgh, hmm. which sounds like, uh, gee, I don't know, Ronald Reagan or, you know, on a, in his most anti-big government moment um, right before the election. And so Roosevelt even is, he calls for a 25% reduction in government spending. Hmm. No ifs, ands, or buts. He right. reiterates that. In fact, I got him on audio reiterating it, which I didn't <laughs> think I'd ever get. He reiterates that. So he's pushing 25% cut in government spending. And, wow. you know, everybody seems fine with that. That's in 1932. And of course, he changes his mind later. So I'm not saying he was an anti-big government candidate, but I'm saying those views resonated with a lot of people. Uh, the country was very much in flux. And one could have imagined, a, you know, someone like Roosevelt going in in multiple directions in 1933. There were very popular governors who were budget cutters. He could have gone in that direction. Who knows? He didn't. But I'm just saying that there was ideological flux. Americans were upset about the status quo, but that doesn't mean they were going in the direction of the New Deal. And it does not mean they were going in the direction of fascism. And it does not mean they were going in the direction of communism, because those movements are not going anywhere in the United States mm -hmm. in that period. I mean, maybe there's little plots and so forth, but they're not going anywhere. So, um, you know, Americans are, you know, the idea that we're going to end up like Soviet Union or Nazi Germany is just not on the table. And so the idea that Roosevelt saved us from those fates is also, I think, bogus and not, oh. not, not believable. There are no threats from those directions that are significant. Oh, God. I mean, <laughs> if you want, I mean, some of the most spectacular lying, lying in American presidential history, which is saying a lot. <laughs> comes from Franklin Roosevelt when he was talking about incessantly talking about how Hitler was going to fly airplanes from Germany to Cape Verde and then from Cape Verde to South America and then from South America to Mexico and then from Mexico they were going to bomb the southern United States because Germany had no long range planes at the time so he made up this entire fantasy about how any minute Germany could be bombing New York City and New Orleans all made up entirely the guy was a dissembler of uh, epic proportions. Now, and then when um, he was challenged on that, I believe he kind of made a joke or he just sort of made a diversionary joke. He never presented evidence to back this up. Oh, God, no. Even the media at the time said, wait a minute, where's your evidence for this? Yeah. Well, so I was going to say, so your, I mean, your book, Taxpayers and Revolt, you know, shows that the support for the New Deal, the support for taxation and redistribution through government programs, which is essentially what the New Deal was, was not so popular among ordinary middle class people and working class people. But also the other thing that wasn't popular among them was war. As and many people know this, you know, this was what's called the isolationist moment in American mm -hmm. history, the 1920s and 1930s. That's actually, I think, a misnomer. It was really just an anti-interventionist culture during that time. People just didn't want to go into another world war having just experienced the worst war ever in history at that point in World War One. Um, so taxpayers in revolt, you have you say taxpayers leagues all across the country that are not interested in the New Deal program whatsoever. In fact, they sound sort of libertarian ish. Is this right? 
Yeah, I think there there are. If you were a libertarian at that time, you'd you know you'd you'd want to join these groups, right? You want to be supportive of them. They're a little bit more populist, but they're they're saying all these things. They're recalling American traditions. They're saying we're like you know the American Revo- you know people in the American Revolution. That's what we need here. And one of their popular arguments was. Well, I've had to cut back, and of course, people had to cut back tremendously during the Great Depression. I'm not making as much as I used to. I've got to tighten my belt. So why doesn't government have to do it? Mm -hmm. Instead of pushing kind of a Keynesian idea of we've got to have massive spending and so forth, government needs to help us a lot of saying, you know, they got to cut back like I had to. It's a very popular argument. Right. So this dovetails, I think, with your other book, which I absolutely adore. And I, I, I tell people about this book, I'm telling you, David, just about weekly um, on mutual aid societies and how they were pushed out or replaced by essentially New Deal programs. People do not know that you can tell me, but I mean, is what countless millions of working class and poor people of every color and ethnicity for decades and decades in this country before the New Deal, who were helping each other, who were providing things like health insurance and housing and education and loans and grant, all this stuff. Um, Working class immigrant folks doing this through mutual aid societies without the government doing this, they were providing themselves with welfare before the government did it, before the New Deal government under Roosevelt essentially pushed them out. Can you tell that story? Yeah, these, these were mass organizations, fraternal societies, and that was a term that would encompass female organizations. I was once corrected by a, uh, a specialist in women's history who says, sororial, you didn't say sororial. I said, well, I didn't say that because they didn't call themselves that. They <laughs> called them, there were women's organizations, fraternal as in fraternity and liberty and equality. That's how they, uh, brotherhood and sisterhood, right, that transcends community. That's what fraternal meant to them anyway. These groups were all over the place. You know, you had groups like the Odd Fellows and the Masons and the Knights of Pythias, but you had all these immigrant groups, Polish National Alliance, you had the Jewish Landsmannschaft, and you had the uh, Japanese, had their mm. Chinese, they're all over the place. They're providing um, they're providing social services. And like you said, there are millions of people. E- you know, labor historians, those that, you know, and there's some good ones out there. Um, will say, look, more workers had a lodge card membership and a lodge card than a labor union membership. You know, labor unions, as you know, were were pretty lucky until the Wagner Act to get up to 10 percent, you know, of workers. That's of workers. You've got maybe a third of adult, you know, Americans belonging to fraternal societies. And a lot of them are workers. And they provide a wide range of services, including unemployment insurance, medical insurance. In fact, that led to a kind of spinoff of my a Howard book came out of this book, really, right. indirectly. Right. Um, um, you had uh, orphanages, you had homes for the elderly, you had all this stuff, these massive organizations, which historians have pretty much ignored. Ignored. There's some stuff about the ritual has embedded gender, you know, whatever. You got some of that stuff. Right. But very little, and it's not for lack of sources. There are, there are, uh, there's a rich array of sources on fraternal societies. There's tons of material where you can really do history from the ground up about who belonged to them, about uh, how they operated, and that kind of thing. The rituals themselves are interesting, um, and again, very little low uh, as a whole on these organizations. So it's sort of the same thing. They go against the narrative, which is, you know, you get the you you add the poor, you add the charities, right? And they failed. These aren't really charities, by the way. Right. They're, they you, you add they failed, and so you know they were overwhelmed by the Great Depression. So then you get the welfare state occurring. And you you get this progression and ignoring this role of mutual aid um, and, uh, you know, and ignoring sort of the Depression era policies of Roosevelt that kept us in a depression for 10 years. Yeah, right. Yes, I think mutual aid and charities were under strain. I don't think they they I think they did a heroic job in many ways and were up to the task in many ways. But we're certainly under strain where you have a depression in the last 10 years. you got to pay dues. Right. Mm-hmm. Got to work, 
you know, it's kind of hard to keep your, your membership and so forth. But I would, in that case, put the blame more on the government policies that gave us a 10 year depression mm -hmm. rather than any shortcomings by the response to that depression, which I think yeah. was heroic in many ways. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. And, and, and again, this goes against the narrative because these groups are doing it. They're not political groups for the most part. Mm -hmm. They're they're multi-class. That's mm -hmm. not necessarily good. So people look historians looking for class warfare are going to be disappointed because fraternal societies generally said, no, we're all you, you might have a uh, laborer on the stage presiding over a meeting where the factory owner is joining as an initiate of the lodge. You might have that. I mean, again, generally, you've got the middle class dominant and so forth, but you had that kind of thing happening. Multi-class organizations transcended party as well. Mm. So they, they skewed partisanship. So mm -hmm. this isn't sort of heroic workers ba battling against the capitalists, yep. um, you know, here, you know, and, and they're, they're heroic workers to helping each other. <laughs> and and <laughs> it's yes. not as sexy a story for a lot That's of the right. stories. And these fraternal <laughs> and the fraternal societies were also of all colors and ethnicities. You haven't even mentioned the African American fraternal societies, which is, as I said, as you said, is the subject of another book we're going to get to on T. R. M. Howard. But well, I discuss it as well in the in my in the mutual aid book, but it's a kind of spinoff from that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and people are blown away when they find out that poor black people in the Jim Crow South had fraternal organizations that that allowed for all sorts of basically welfare. To happen, I mean, to that help people in all sorts of ways. But I want to let's do the nuts and bolts in this history. I want to make sure people are really clear about this. So, roughly, how many fraternal organizations? You're saying it's about a third of Americans were a part of these at some point. When that's, did they a, start? that's a conservative estimate. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. When did they start? Um, and they sort of faded with the New Deal in the 30s and 40s, right? But how long was this going on in the United States? How many were there? Where were they? And how did they work? How did they operate? Well, there were thousands of them, thousands. and you could go way, way back. Um, and uh, they're mostly an urban phenomenon, but you could you could trace them back to the medieval guilds and the uh, medieval confraternities, which had similarities. And there's a lot of literature on those. And the Masons, in some kind of way, come out of the guild system. You know, the the stone masons. At least they adopt their ritual, and they probably come out of the stone masons. And, and eventually, most of the people in them are not stonemasons, and that's an interesting story. Maybe they liked their, you know, their made they partied better or whatever. But they ended up getting a lot of non stonemasons. So by the early 19th century, these groups are growing rapidly. Groups like the Odd Fellows and, yeah. the, and the Knights of Pythias and the Masons, and they really start growing. I think quite rapidly as you get more and more urbanization, people going into small towns. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think people in the country had maybe other methods to take care of situations. Um, so lodges are really just explosive, explosive growth in the late 19th, um, early 20th century. And they're occurring among everybody. As you said, African-Americans, you, you add all these leading white organizations like the Masons, the Odd Fellows and the Knights of Pythias. Well, guess what? You had a black version of each one. Hmm. They tried to join the white organizations and were excluded. And so they formed their own, including I, my favorite is the Knights of Pythias. Some Pullman porter found a copy of the ritual on a train and said, oh, and he set up the colored Knights of Pythias, um, which was one of the leading ones. But a lot of these Black groups like the Odd Fellows and the Masons, they had gotten their approval from the Home Lodge in, in, in Britain. Uh, so they had as much claim, maybe more so, because they actually had the paperwork to be legitimacy than some of the white organizations. And uh, these groups are just growing explosively. How did they work? Well, they were lodge centered. So the center of action to varying degrees was in the lodge. The leadership of the organization be elected from the ranks of the members, right? And uh, they would have rituals, which served as kind of a gatekeeper message. They'd have, they would combine community, uh, sociology, you know, social activities such as dances and sporting contests and so forth with providing social services. And if you lived in Pittsburgh, 
and you're belonging to one of the larger groups, say Knights of Pythias, and you want to move to San Francisco, you get a transfer card, you go to San Francisco, and then you can immediately say, hey, I'm your brother from, you know, wherever. And they would, you would have the full benefit of membership. So the benefits have an advantage over a lot of, you know, company plans, for example, that they're, they're portable. And uh, that was a big advantage of, 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 of these organizations. Um, some of the more, you know, I guess you could say anti-statist labor leaders, I guess you could say in some ways, like Samuel Gompers, mm. he was a big fan of fraternal societies. Mm. Um, he did not like government health insurance, but he liked the lodge because he mm. said these groups are they're independent free men, you know, who are providing their own services. So it wasn't always a hostile atmosphere relationship between labor unions and lodges. So they cross boundaries, hmm. right? You have someone like Gompers is a Mason, but then he, you know, you've got some wealthy people in the Masons, for example. Right. But would you say the membership of these was predominantly working class? That's a good question. I, I think it depends a lot on the organization. Um, I would say the Masons have significant working class membership, but probably not a majority, but certain groups like the Odd Fellows, yeah, I'd say, I'd say majority uh, working okay. class. Some of these groups from Eastern Europe, I looked at one, um, there was a Czech organization, um, you know, or groups like that, Sons of Italy and so forth. Those were, in the early stages, were overwhelmingly working class, often right. laborers. Yeah. Uh, black organizations, even the Masons, were overwhelmingly working class because, you know, the elite in the in the Masons among among African Americans was the Pullman Porters, right? That was mm -hmm. the elite in the organization, mm -hmm. and so it really depends on the situation. So then, then what are the economics of this, right? Because we're talking about in many cases poor people, not just working class, especially when you're talking about immigrants with very few resources. They had to pay dues, right? Uh, I'm assuming the dues were low enough for the uh, an average, you know, steel worker in Pittsburgh to afford, and they and they would get what for it? What was the deal here that was? Being yeah, they offered? were they were they were generally low, and it was very typical for people to belong to more than once one fraternal society. Oh. So you'd get I, I'll get some more protection in this group. And people really didn't have much of a problem with that. It, 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 actually, fraternal societies represent a kind of cooperative uh, tolerance. Um, they even promoted doctrines internally of tolerance, despite the reputation they have. Um, um, but you were asking about um, what were you asking about specifically? You were asking well, like, about like dues and what you what you would. Oh, get dues. For your, what well, you, get for your dues, um, yeah. you could get they, they start to at the turn of the century. Many of the societies start to provide medical care. And originally wow. this was, uh, I guess you'd say, primary care. Sort of like the Cuban barefoot doctors, I guess, in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. And these people would go around, they give house calls, and they would elect doctors at lodge meetings. And the doctors would actually run for office. And often doctors would serve as lodge doctors earlier in their career because it got them contacts in the community. Then they'd set up their own private practice. Or when they went into retirement, semi-retirement, they would maintain their Lodge status. How much does this cost? Hmm. You're talking about one to two dollars a year uh, oh. per member for the services of a lodge doctor, including house calls. Hmm. So, you know, even if it's been a while since I did this, but even if you were to put that in your inflation calculator, uh, that's dirt cheap. Yeah. Um, medical care. Wow. Um, and these these are in the medical profession hated with a passion. The what they call the lodge practice evil. That was the term they used over and over again. So that was actually very good source material for me to go to the medical journal of New Jersey. You know, normally, you know, I wouldn't be why well, bother read this boring stuff. New Jersey Medical Society, and they just go and they're going hysteric. They're hysterical about the lodge practice evil. And they talk about the election. It's I was humiliated. One of our doctors is humiliated in this election where these workers would ask them all sorts of impertinent questions. You know, and this, you know, they, they're saying stuff. It's like unbelievable. Um, maybe it's believable, but they're, they're, their mask is really ripped off. So uh, that is an early form of medical care, cooperative 
Hmm. Kind of, I guess, you know, just a cooperative, not fee for service. You get a flat uh, amount. And the medical profession really wages war on this. And I think has a role in hmm. in undermining these through uh, uh, certification, through um, just squeezing down the medical profession, reducing the size of the medical profession um, um, from which the, you know, people would could survive because if you were a young doctor, this is a way you could survive. You didn't need necessarily these big connections. You didn't need these connections with these, you know, big universities and so forth. Um, um, you had an independent base. Um, later, as I discuss in my book, um, although again, this is very constrained by, by all of this, these attacks, um, you, you get the rise of fraternal societies providing hospital care. And a key part of my book on um, both the fraternal societies and then Howard is about that story of fraternal societies among African-Americans in the Mississippi Delta, the poorest part, one of the poorest regions in the United States, yep. one of the most oppressed regions in the United States mm -hmm. in, you know, before, you know, the civil rights movement. I just love this story about TRM. So, so you discovered one of these doctors you discovered was this man, TRM Howard, who became the subject of another book of yours. And uh, just a remarkable story of uh, a black doctor and I guess activist, you would call it, um, who also wasn't afraid of guns. Oh, not at all. And uh, <laughs> the story on that is, you know, I, I found through a court case that there was this fraternal hospital in Mississippi run by the Knights and Daughters of Tabor called the Taborian Hospital. And the membership of this fraternal group, which predominantly female, by the way, predominantly sharecroppers, uh, got up to 50,000 because they built this hospital in the early 1940s, which provided a full range of of, uh, of, 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 of of medical services for like $8, 30 days hospitalization for like eight fifty a year. <laughs> and uh, they hired this guy named Dr. TRM Howard, who this local historian in Mount Bayou kept pitching to me. So he's, he's interesting. You should look at half yeah, whatever. Like, mm -hmm. you know, some young snot nose writing about mutual aid. I can't, I'm just focused on that. But then I got into Howard. I said, man, everything else is thrown aside. And I think you understand why. He's such a great, great guy to write about. He's so yeah. fun. Uh, Howard was this African-American. He was born in Murray, Kentucky. His whole background was there was all this lynching going on there. These wars of uh, uh, the Black Patch Wars and so forth. He was in the middle of that, born on a battlefield, really. Mm -hmm. And then he ends up hooking up with this white doctor who kind of patronizes him, who's a Seventh-day Adventist. Hmm. And Howard went to Seventh-day Adventist schools. Oh. Um, and he ends up uh, uh, going to Loma Linda University. And he then he ends up taking a job for this new hospital in the Mississippi Delta, the, the belly of the beast of Jim Crow, which is the, you know, in some ways not though, because it was an all black town. In fact, I'm doing a podcast series about it called Mound Bayou, oh, which was a town in the Mississippi Delta, which was formed by a slave, uh, ex-slave of Joseph Davis, who was Jefferson Davis's brother. <laughs> and Joseph Davis is kind of a philanthropist and, uh, you know, wanted sort of self-government from his slaves. And so uh, these guys you know, were inspired by this experience. And they set up this all black town. They had a black mayor, black police chief. Everybody voted there. This is in the Mississippi Delta where you have whole counties where you don't have a single black majority counties where you don't have a single black voter. So it was a real haven wow. um, and in some ways. And you didn't have to worry about curfews, you know, being off the street certain times a day. There was no white law enforcement people to push you around. Um, everybody was black and you it was self-governing. So it was a really great place to start this hospital, but it was also a hub for civil rights. Mm -hmm. and it illustrates that Booker T. Washington was essentially right, that the economic base is key. And, uh -huh. uh, uh, and, and so it's an entrepreneurial movement too, uh -huh. the civil rights movement that Howard leads and I'm getting ahead of the story, but um, he, 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 he's very successful doctor, very charismatic community builder, builds a, 
puts the first swimming pool in for blacks, builds an entertainment center, a zoo, um, and raises hunting dogs and quail, gets a plantation of a thousand acres. And then he, he eventually moves into civil rights and he hires Edgar Evers is one of his first uh, employees and brings him into the civil rights movement. My God. Whew. So Mount Bayou, this is happening. We're talking about in the thirties, right? And forties. He comes in the early forties. I think in 42 is when he arrives there, but mm -hmm. Mount Bayou had been founded like in the 1890s, but it was kind of on its last legs at the time Howard came. Okay. And it was in, it was in really battered condition and he really interjects new life there, revives it. In the Mississippi Delta at the height of Jim Crow, an all black town with. Yeah, black this is where power. Emmett Till was killed. I mean, and Howard oh. was involved in that case. But I mean, <laughs> this is an area where there's it's, it's much more. I don't want to diminish Martin Luther King at all, but it is a much, much more hostile atmosphere than someone like Montgomery, where you have a black middle class. You oh, have yeah. blacks voting. King voted. Um, this is a place that is is just horrific by comparison it's the closest thing we've come to a totalitarian society i think in american mm -hmm. history was the mississippi uh, mm -hmm. delta and, and maybe the black belt too in, in in you know alabama but it was just it was just pervasive right um and it was all consuming it was like uh cancel culture of you know everybody bought into it and everybody played their part in maintaining it but there were little opportunities there for people too to have some success if right. they knew what to do and Howard could maneuver. Yeah. So, I mean, how, how did this happen? I mean, how in the middle of this totalitarian society, you have this black enclave with real black power, economic and political power. I mean, how did they, how did they maintain that? How did they preserve it and protect it? Well, they were very careful. Uh, yeah. But, uh, they were out there in the, in this in this kind of it was a swamp land. It was sort of isolated, and they started this community. And they kind of made it clear we don't want to we don't want to cause any trouble, right? We're conservative. We just want to be an example. But they wanted to be an example for uh, for African Americans. And some important people give speeches there, including Teddy Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington give speeches there and see it as a model. So somehow they're able to survive. But it's an interesting story as to how they're able to survive, because there are times when the community is very much threatened, but they are able to, to persist. And that is where African-Americans in the state of Mississippi will often have their conventions, their meetings. It's safe. And it is where this civil rights movement, long before you know King comes along, thrives in, in, in a major way, led by T.R.M. Howard. Mm -hmm. And in the South, there were no gun control laws. Well, I wouldn't quite agree with that. There were okay. gun control laws. If if you wanted to buy a pistol and carry it um, um, or have it in your car, um, you had to get a permit from the white county sheriff. Oh, I didn't know they that. They rarely granted those permits to African-Americans. Now, if oh. you had long guns, shotguns, that kind of thing, yeah. You know, it's it's pretty open, but they okay. enforce that as well. And uh, I came across some great examples where Howard had, was a bunch a bunch of guys in a car. They were pulled over. They found pistols on his quote bodyguards. I don't know if they were really bodyguards, but they found them on him. And they like had to pay like a hundred dollars fee, which is the nineteen fifties. That's a lot of money. Yeah. And they said, we searched everyone and found pistols on all these bodyguards. But on Dr. Howard, we didn't find a pistol. Well, it turns out he had a secret compartment in his car and he'd push a little button and he'd put the gun in there anytime he was pulled over by the police. But he had an arsenal. He had a Thompson submachine gun, which he <laughs> loved to show off. Ah. He was a big game hunter. This is one of the reasons people don't like him, I think, too. Of course. Who killed all these animals and had a whole room in his house in Chicago called the Safari Room. He boasted about it. He says, I'm I'm the you know first significant, you know, black American big game hunter. You know, that was something he was proud of. <laughs> he didn't dwell on civil rights. He didn't dwell on the past. Makes him appealing. But he didn't go and say, I was involved in that. He wasn't that kind of guy. He was always moving on to a new project that was going to be the greatest thing ever. So he's forward looking. And that means he can't be pigeonholed in a, like a lot of these people mm -hmm. can. 
And he provided a lot of cheap medical care, cheap and good, I think, medical care for very, very poor people in Mississippi, right? Well, yes, these fraternal societies. I mean, again, this is low cost medical care. But I, you know, even though he ended up in Chicago and I was told a story by someone who knew him who said some critical things about him. And he said, you know, Howard would literally give you the shirt off his back and that he would see people trying to come in the clinic after closing hours. And he would tell people, he said, you let those people in. Hmm. Howard was the kind of guy I've heard Cornell West is like this, too, interestingly enough, oh, yeah? that if you're a conference at a conference or whatever, and he strikes up a conversation with a janitor, um, he will just be that guy will be the center of his attention. Yep. You try to come to him. He'll say, let me finish here. Howard was like that. So he had the common touch. But then through his wife, really, who was part of the black elite. He was tied in with the black elite. So he could navigate between these worlds. But he was a poor boy made good. And he could talk about anything. Um, and he's very charming and down to earth. And, and, and that, you know, he certainly had his flaws, but he had a tremendous charisma on that kind of personal level that right. people were drawn to. So then what is the importance of him? Like, why, <clears throat> why does this matter? You know, so what? Why, why is TRM Howard's career in life matter? What's the political significance of it? Well, he started a mass movement for civil rights. This is before Martin Luther King. Um, in the middle of Mississippi Delta, in this town of less than a thousand people, they'd get 10,000 people to these grand festivals to hear speakers like Thurgood Marshall, entertainers like Mahalia Jackson. Mm. It was like a giant party. He would mobilize thousands. 1951, he organized the first well, one of the early successful boycotts, um, and this was of service stations that refused to provide restrooms for African-Americans. So often if you're African-American, you go to a gas station, they would say, you know, we don't have restrooms for colored people. And, uh, and you had a movement where they had bumper stickers. This is very risky. Don't buy gas where you can't use the restroom. They had 10,000 of these and you can see them, you know, all over the place this boycott was successful. The service stations felt the heat, in part, I think, because some national chains get involved in it, mm -hmm. but they end up putting in, these, uh, putting in these restrooms, which some people have dismissed and said, well, they're putting in colored restrooms. Well, let's remember, folks, that the initial demand of the Montgomery bus boycott was not integration. It was separate but truly equal. Yes. So this is very, very radical in Mississippi terms. Howard also hired Medgar Evers, was his mentor, civil rights mentor. There's an importance. Evers got his first experience working for this boycott. Howard um, uh, introduced Fannie Lou Hamer to the civil rights movement, another oh, legend. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I wanna brag about this as much, but Operation Push, Jesse Jackson's organization was founded in Howard's living room. Howard was an early financial supporter and Jackson no spoke at Howard's funeral. No kidding. Um, huh. And that's an interesting story. I could yeah. never get an interview with him. I wonder, I've got some ideas, but um, in any case, he is. Uh, oh, and then when the Brown decision comes, mm -hmm. Howard has a meeting with the governor of Mississippi. This is pre Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. He leads a mass group. He's a leader to a bunch of leading black figures in the state. The governor thinks he's going to persuade these people to go along with the plan to scuttle the Brown decision. And the governor's plan is I will truly spend the money. And I think the governor was sincere in this to equalize school spending crash program for black schools. As long as we can keep segregation. And Howard says too late. We might have gone for this earlier, but no more. Headline news about how he insulted the governor. He supports campaigns to petition um, for uh, integration. And then, of course, this has been a big deal recently. And there's, a, there's even a TV series where Howard is a character in it. In the Emmett Till case. Mm -hmm. Howard was the guy that was most instrumental in getting that case noticed. Emmett Till's mother stays with Howard when she comes to Mississippi. He provides her an armed escort. Um, mm. witnesses stay with him. He gives them refuge. Black reporters stay with him. And he leads a, 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 a midnight, one o'clock in the morning search for evidence and witnesses that does find uh, a witness who's 
very persuasive, but the court doesn't go along with it. And out of that, the Emmett Till case, you get the modern civil rights movement, arguably. Rosa Parks, her first big meeting after Emmett Till was killed in Montgomery, had Howard as the main speaker. Over a thousand people came. His host was Martin Luther King, then unknown minister. This is in December, 50, November 55, five days later after his speech. Uh, she refuses to give up her seat. And she said later, I was thinking of Emmett Till. Hmm. And that had been the topic of Howard's speech only five days earlier. Hmm. So that, I guess, I don't know what more of the people need. This is his importance. <laughs> certainly if you think civil rights is an important aspect of American history, and I think most people will agree it is, he is instrumental in um, the modern the creation of the modern civil rights movement through his activities. There, there's even more. There's even more about his importance. So as I keep saying, oh, yes. he, he was mm -hmm. also, unlike King and the civil rights movement who we all know about, he was not nonviolent. Yeah, Howard, Howard was always emphasized, don't initiate violence. Sure. That he was consistent on that. Sure. But he also said, you know, don't be afraid to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. And this is real. See, this is part of history. It goes against the narrative. Everyone thinks of gun culture as a white thing, right? Much of rednecks. Right. There's yeah. a black gun culture. I mean, Super, my, yeah. my wife is African-American. I'll tell you, her father was he's always pulling on his guns and showing me and he wasn't afraid <laughs> to use them. Oh, yeah. But that he was born in a, a farm, you know, in, in 1930s in, in, in Alabama. But that's rural gun culture. And it's all it's still very much alive here. In fact, I think the black congresswoman in um, Alabama often votes against gun control because, hmm. hey, people hunt for food in the black right. belt. So that's there. Um, and so I think even King kind of understood that as his movement grew, that people are are heavily armed. And that's one of the reasons why you have rallies. In, in 10,000 people, as I mentioned, and here's the kind of speech Howard would give at that rally. You had a senator named Theodore G. Bilbo, the most racist member of the Senate, just notorious. Yep. And Bilbo, Howard say, well, you know, Bilbo had been dead a few years. Howard says, did you hear that Senator Bilbo just sent a letter to the governor of Mississippi? And uh, you know what he said in that letter? Said, he said, uh, uh, please, uh, um, uh, Please quit uh, harassing the colored people of Mississippi because we got a colored fireman down here who's keeping it mighty hot for us. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that's inflammatory? This is 1954, 55, before Martin Luther King. That's mm -hmm. the kind of speech he gives. So why weren't you know why wasn't he killed? Why weren't people at this rally killed? Why were there no examples of violence at these rallies of ten thousand people with these inflammatory things going on, right? I think my argument, and I think other historians would agree with me who've written about this, not just libertarian or whatever, that it's because people are heavily armed. Absolutely. And they know that if anyone gets in close, they may get out of shop, but then they're going to be dead because they're going to be people that will fire back. And Howard was quite clear in letting people know that. I got a great picture where he's got a long gun, a rifle, He's he's cooking food for the rally, uh, you know, barbecue. Right. And he's got this rifle. It's a picture in Ebony, you know, just sitting out on a box as he, you know, all these people in the crowd behind him and he's cooking for him. Um, he knew, you know, so he said, fight, you know, fight back. And he was willing to do that. But again, it was the kind of thing where this is Mississippi Delta It's very dangerous. And but. People can even whites can understand kind of a gun culture, rural gun culture. Yeah. You know, the book, um, to some extent, they can even they can kind of appreciate that, even though the, there's early gun control laws being pushed during this time, mm -hmm. um, and including that I mentioned. But the, Mississippi is a there are several popular gun control measures which are being pushed in the legislature. Yeah. A lot the, of people don't know that. Yeah. The book on this is Charles Cobb. I think the title is. That non that nonviolent stuff will get you killed. It's a history of the civil rights movement and how it relied on armed self-defense from the beginning to the end, including Martin Luther King. Exactly. Who, including whose King. House, 
whose house in Montgomery was described as by one of his advisors as, quote, an arsenal. And so, even King suppo- supposedly gave up his guns eventually. But he right. and all those rallies, he is surrounded by pe- groups like the Deacons for the Defense yes. and all these groups that are providing armed protection. This is true in Tuscaloosa. There's a very interesting work. Um, they have Bloody Sunday here. And you add these World War II veterans that were armed and would provide armed security, and everyone knew it, for civil rights demonstrators. Exactly. This is the South, folks. Now people That's have right. guns. That's right. And um, so, again, that goes against the view that you hear out there, right? Exactly. That just, the Second Amendment is part of an attempt, you know, just nonsense to put down slaves. I guess they they that's big motivation in Connecticut and places like that. that had yeah. Their own similar amendments. But anyway, that's that's the kind of argument. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> the history of gun control in this country is racist. Thoroughly. It's a heavy theme. Definitely. And this sure. is understood by people like uh, Howard, but it was also understood by 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 other African-American figures that are kind of well-known um, figures like Ida, Ida B. Wells. And so Ida forth. B. Wells. But, yeah. yeah. Right. Freedom. Freedom comes from a, having a Winchester rifle. She says something like that. Um, there wasn't there also a black bank involved uh, associated with TRM Howard. Oh, yeah. Like you said, the story never ends. I feel right. like I, 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 I could, I'm a motor mouth with Howard, but I, <laughs> I didn't remember that. This is a good one. There is a black bank building still there. I just posed in front of it recently, but it's, huh. they, it still exists, but it moved. But it's called Tri-State and it's yeah. in um, right. uh, Memphis. Or is it Nashville? I'm trying to remember. It's uh, uh, I think it's Memphis. Yeah. And it is one of the leading black banks in the country. Howard was on it was founded in the 40s and Howard is on the board of directors. And so there is something going on in beginning in 54 when Howard and others are trying to what they're trying to do is petition school districts to integrate the schools and do other things. But then they face this economic pressure where local whites are saying, uh, we're, you know, we're going to not, we're going to call on your loans. We're going to subject you to economic pressure. And it's pretty effective. Hmm. And so Howard has this idea. He says, well, a lot of our people can't get loans from the local bank who often are members of citizens council. So here's what we, we should do. We should go around the country and urge African-American philanthropic groups, businesses, and ever to give money to a a, a fund to fight what they call the credit freeze. Hmm. Um, and they, they call them the anti-freeze boys. So we need some anti-freeze. And that would be they'd raise a bunch of money and then uh, they would they would deposit the money in Tri-State. And then that money would be used as a basis to make loans at regular interest rates, you know, um, you know, competitive interest rates to local African-Americans who couldn't get it from the local white, you know, potentate or bank um, is a way to break this credit freeze. And by a lot of indications, the whites eventually gave up on this strategy to a great extent because of this effort. This is all organized by Howard, where they're going around uh, pushing this, let's raise money and put it in tri-state, and then we'll use that as a basis to loan out money to people. And now, it, it worked quite well. This is, it, this is a stunning story uh, of Black people helping themselves uh, against all the odds in the midst of Jim Crow. Why, David, have, have, have liberal and left-wing historians ignored this? Well, Howard was not a liberal. <laughs> he was not left-wing. <laughs> right. I wouldn't call him very ideological. He had libertarian aspects. He was for legalization of prostitution in the 1930s. What? There you go. What? Yeah. <laughs> and he, uh, he even had a kind of a private property defense of, uh, of uh, you know, conservation because he killed all these animals. And he said, there's a market for that. You know, it's kind of bizarre. So he had these, the, and he was an entrepreneur and he was very anti-communist. And I think you could say King is anti-communist, but he's a little tolerant of them. Howard, mm-hmm. He, he says at one point, and I think it's hyperbole because he's not some McCarthyite exactly, although he makes a good comment about McCarthy. That's interesting. He says, I wish there was one bomb that would blow up all the communists in the country. <laughs> and there was a rally that was uh, Du Bois was one of the speakers. 
W.E.B. Du Bois, who at that time was becoming more involved with communist front groups. Howard right. found out about this and he was going to speak at this rally. He says, I'm not going to speak at that rally. So Hoover, this is another great thing about Howard, singled out Howard as an enemy, J. Edgar Hoover. But even Hoover searched for it, could not find any evidence of communist uh, connections. So Howard is anti-communist. So that's one reason I think he isn't appreciated. He's a big promoter of entrepreneurship, right? Um, that's perhaps another reason. He doesn't toot his own horn. That has something to do with it. Of course, the history of early history is written in the 60s at a time when there's a real reaction against what Howard would call green power. He thought green power was good, but everyone else is, you know, even King saying that's kind of selfish. And, you know, King is not really pro business at all. Howard is. Right. So that has a lot to do with him. But then, you know, you think a guy like this, someone like Glenn Beck would really like this guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I have had no success with Glenn Beck. And I, can you guess why? I think it's just a guess. Howard did something else that, disrupts the narrative from conservatives oh, abortion howard was an abortionist in mississippi uh this he guy. did it on white women and that was very common <laughs> by the way for black doctors is all this phobia about abortion about right. interracial sex and there's sort of the hypocrisy here obviously because the white white people in the elite when their daughters were in trouble send them to dr howard but that was true other parts of the south too they relied on black doctors because they'd be discreet and, you know, the word wouldn't get out. So, yeah, have a black doctor fool around down there. It's fine. Oh, amazing. And then in the 60s, Howard is a leading, perhaps the leading illegal abortionist than legal abortionist in Chicago. And he's a believer in it. He is a, he's arrested a couple of times. He always gets out of it. There's interesting stories there. He sets up a, 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 the day Roe v. Wade is announced. He's got a woman on the table almost right away. And it's leading black owned clinic on the South side. Uh, so he's doing that. So, yeah, if, if I go to Glenn Beck and I have, cause I want to sell books, I got to believe they said, all right, Glenn, we can't do this. Right. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Um, so that's yeah. one reason. And I had a conservative libertarian guy. I could tell you privately who he was. I won't do it publicly, but he's well known figure. And I wanted him to do a blurb for the book or do me some sort of favor. And I sent him, all this. Howard's great. And he was even interested in Martin Luther King. He was interested in civil rights. Mm. Abortions? Uh, no. Howard also had a lot of illegitimate children. Mm. No, I can't do. No, come on. And, and, and so that is going to rub people the wrong way. Well, of course, we've got all this recent stuff on King, though. So, you know, maybe he doesn't look so terrible on that issue. But uh, certainly the abortions. And he, go, he marches to his own drummer. He Stunning. he rejects what he calls the genocide arguments as black people are talking too much about genocide. Hmm. And he, he, he really there's a, a lot of figures who uh, African-Americans at the time. And this is where the conservatives are. Right. There's a lot of opposition to abortion. And he gets he gets some flack from that, including from Jesse Jackson. Hmm. Jackson was associating with the likes of Pat Robinson in the 1970s right jackson was super duper anti-abortionist right. and he would talk about the men in the white coats the murderers That's in right. the white coats That's howard right. heard out heard about that and had a public fight with jackson in the press he said well if you think i'm a murderer you don't want my money do you i mean he was a big supporter of operation push and he cut him off they reconciled but there's stories about you know what happened there but um but in any case, Howard is going against the grain, even among a lot of African-Americans, people like Elijah Muhammad and yeah. Dick Gregory was a big Howard fan, was a guy that you know didn't mm -hmm. like abortion. Mm -hmm. I've been told Fannie Lou Hamer was kind of anti-abortion initially. So, you know, huh. there's that strain out there, definitely. And they're making that kind of genocide argument. He doesn't buy into that. Very modern arguments in some sense. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's sort of like. Women in the Mississippi Delta, there's nothing to do. People just have sex and they have a bunch of children they can't support. You know, that's kind of his argument. It's kind of a pragmatic argument. Really. Right. Uh, he's just well, he's just a, such an amazing figure. So he and he, again, he's been studiously ignored by the historical profession other than you. Um, and here's here is one major reason that he's been ignored, David. It's because he and all those mutual aid societies that you've been talking about 
helps people without the government. That is absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. Liberals, liberals believe in their hearts, of course, that the government must be the agency to help the poor and the oppressed and especially black people. Right. Well, the hospitals, Howard set up his own competing hospital. He broke with the Taborians. So they had two hospitals across the street from each other. But neither one of these got a dime of government aid. So it's an amazing thing. These hospitals were in existence for a long time. They got they provided these services. No government support at all. In fact, it was despite the government, because by the 60s, the licensing authorities are really trying to harass them and for some stupid reasons. Um, um, but Howard, um, you know, yeah, he is not a guy that is is uh, that he's a Republican. Interestingly enough, he runs uh-huh. he runs for Congress against the uh, Dawson, who runs the Democratic machine in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Um, and he gets the support from a lot of people that end up being involved later with the reformist element among African-Americans like uh, Harold Washington. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a small world there, that black elite, very small world. Mm -hmm. So I talked to Howard's brother-in-law, who was the first black executive at Pepsi Cola, Hmm. very interesting guy. And, you know, it's just like, yeah, I saw Josephine Baker there. I saw, you know, I mean, they all, people all knew each other. It was a very small world, so it was a lot of fun to to talk to these people. One of Howard's good friends was Jesse Owens, a fellow Republican from Chicago. That's right. Um, Yeah. And uh, uh, and again, you know, Howard was a Republican. So that's that's interesting um, that he he's 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 sort of, you know, moving in that direction when a lot of African-Americans are moving away from the Republican Party. No wonder the title of the book is Black Maverick, because he most certainly was. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, now, the back to the mutual aid societies. Um, describe or explain their demise. When did they decline? When did they basically disappear, and why? Well, I think you could certainly point to a lot of competing um, forms of recreation. You could point to uh, commercial insurance. It's getting more efficient. Um, but then again, a lot of people would have membership in a lodge and they'd own a commercial insurance policy. So that was key. What happens though, is it's very devastating is the great depression. And there's some work out there by a historian named Elizabeth Cohn, which is wrong, yeah. which basically it, it's just wrong. I, 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 right. I think I refute it convincingly. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, her argument is these groups, oh, they were they were really nice and, you know, <laughs> and all this. Right. She says mm. all these positive things about them. Mm. She says they mm. just couldn't withstand the Great Depression. They all collapsed. They quit paying benefits. I actually found that these groups were devoting higher percentage to their of their resources to social benefits for members throughout the Depression. However, their membership was hit hard. And again, I think a lot of that is simply due. You just don't want to have a 10-year depression, folks. You had big depression in the 1890s. You had other depressions. And these groups could carry people. They tried to carry people on the rolls. They tried to, you know, support them. They raised money to help them pay their dues. Not like, you know, a typical insurance company. And they would do that and they could do it for a time. But if you have a 10-year depression, piles up and it's a lot more difficult uh, to uh, maintain these things. What is also happening is a lot of these groups had orphanages, for example, and a lot of these are gradually shut down, partly because orphanages are no longer considered uh, the way to go in childcare, and you get the rise of aid to dependent children, which later becomes aid to family families of dependent children and the idea is the kids shouldn't go to an orphanage they you know they should pay the you know whatever there's some interesting literature by the way an orphanage alumni that shows actually they they do pretty well compared to most people huh. they tend to vote more they you know huh. they uh, they tend to have e- be more economically successful and so forth but anyway huh. that's a separate debate and i think there's arguments on both sides so a lot of these and then you have social security and you have the rise of the welfare state, but yeah. you also have s- tremendous subsidies to the employer provided health care, including there. tax benefits. There it is. Right. Where if you provide fringe benefits for your workers, that's not taxed. 
That's right. Um, and uh, increasingly, that comes that's pre World War II. So that has a big effect on yeah. these groups. Tying people, workers are being tied by the 1930s increasingly to the state and to their employer in these kind of hierarchical relationships where reciprocal social welfare, and that's what I would call fraternal societies, side to side, it's really being hammered by that. And I think that's part of what happens in Mississippi too. It comes a little late to the process, but one of the reasons the groups end up declining there by the fifties and sixties is because a lot of African-Americans are getting, um, you know, Medicaid or they're getting, they're working for private employers that are providing fringe benefits. Um, um, so that, that is important as well. So I think there's a lot of things going on, uh, cultural and otherwise, but, but people are resourceful. So it's interesting. I think you can make an argument that given incentives, people are resourceful and they come up with these arrangements. African-Americans didn't have these arrangements before, you know, until really they didn't have them at all. I mean, for the most part, the South until after the Civil War. And they just saw what other people were doing and they did the same thing and did it better in many cases. Doesn't your book just prove that <clears throat> we can have a safety net, a social safety net and quite generous social welfare that is not a part of the state that is outside the government? I think we can. And again, that's sort of my argument that people are resourceful and given incentives, they will, you know, you will get a, a wide range of things going on. Mm -hmm. And I think mutual aid is one and, and it's a menu of things. So again, like I said, people would have savings plans. In fact, there was a form of retirement insurance. This was commercial called Tontine insurance. I don't know if you know about this. No. Wow. Well, Tontine, there's been murder mysteries written about it, but Tontine insurance was where you would get like a, thousands of people, they would all contribute money to a Tontine fund. And this is the crude version of it. And then the last one to survive would get all the money. But what they actually did is everybody, they would say in 20 years, everybody that's still subscribing to the Tontine fund, all the original people would divide up the proceeds. So it was a form of retirement insurance. And there's some interesting work done. That this, this was very much rapidly developing during the progressive era, but was smashed by the uh, insurance investigations starting in New York, where a lot of these insurance companies were. But it was a form of individual retirement account that was really actually sound and on the move and becoming more and more important over time. So you had things like that, but then that's also the era when lodges are thriving. So you'd right. have people, they belong to a lodge, maybe two lodges, they'd have commercial insurance, they'd have a menu of services that they would, they would use, but they rarely went to private charity. That's one thing the historians are right about. They say so few people, these charities aren't helping many people. Yeah, you know, you talk about less than 1% of the population are getting aid at a time when poverty rates are maybe 40%, say 1900, are getting aid from a private charity. Less than 1% are in any institution, like an almshouse, government operated almshouse. But you got 40% poverty. So gee whiz, are people all starving that, you know, um, what about the rest? And historians haven't been interested in writing about the rest. We've got a lot written on poor houses, a lot written on yeah. early welfare programs. But these are insignificant, a drop in the bucket compared to various forms of reciprocal relief, including churches as well. That's right. Um, you know, where you have barn raising and that kind of thing. And again, that's pretty invisible, too. People have written about the Catholic Church, but haven't written about, you know, as a hierarchy, the top of the hierarchy, but haven't written about what's going on on the ground, individual congregations. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and so you got all this stuff going on. That's why you don't have mass starvation. You actually have people moving up the ladder. And as you know, immigrants are more likely in many cases, Eastern European immigrants to own their own homes by the 1920s than natives. Mm -hmm. So you have a tremendous upward mobility. It's really one of the more amazing accomplishments in American history where these people that are written about by Jacob Rees, they don't stay in these tenements. They're out of there in a few years. Yeah. It's a snapshot and they're out That's eventually. Right. You know, through incremental. Yeah. yeah. Mut mutual aid. The title of your book is From Mutual Aid to the Welfare State. Mutual aid was providing for people, the 40 percent in, in remarkable ways for decades and decades. And we are that is kept from us because I believe 
of the common belief, the universal belief among liberals who are dominant in our culture, that the government must provide those things. I think that that's absolutely true. And that I think people are, they're a little upset about that too, because it doesn't fit the stereotype of private charity. These right. are people providing for themselves. These are yeah. true indigenous, many cases, working class organizations. Yeah. So that's adds insult to industry, in, you know, um, injury. It, it, these groups are, have all these features that, um, well, for the civil rights movement, I think they're tremendously important, not just in Mississippi, but the, it's a spinoff of these fraternal societies in Mississippi, but it's also kind of a spinoff other places too, sometimes directly, but sometimes simply people go to lodges. They learn parliamentary skills. They learn organizational skills. They learn how to put together a meeting. They get assertiveness. And guess what? Those are often the same people. Let's start a civil rights group. They know how to do it. They know how to organize. Yeah. Such a remarkable story. It's uh, I think it's one of the most important unknown pieces of history in, in, in the U.S. But uh, I'm going to make sure more people know about this. Now, let's talk about our good friend Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, oh, yeah. So as you know, David, he um, he saved the United States from the <laughs> Depression and he saved the world from the Nazis. And that's the story, isn't it? <laughs> well, also a story uh, it, that was more, you know, I've written a, a lot about was the argument he saved capitalism. Save and FDR capital. would tell everybody and his brother that I saved capitalism. I'm actually, this is a story that's picked this one up. He's actually a conservative president because he saves the system. That's right. And that is absolute nonsense. And I think that that needs to be challenged and not enough people raise questions about that. Where's the threat to capitalism in 1932? Um, I don't see it, right? I don't see the Socialist Party as a bust. I mean, compared to what they had been. Communists, they don't hardly get any votes again. Right. Right. Compared to what you might expect, there's no real mass fascist movement on the ground. Right. Um, even someone like Huey Long. Right. And he's kind of just this corrupt Louisiana politician. I mean, fascist. Mm. Well, nah. I suppose you could make. I mean, I really don't see it. Right. Not in the. Let's put it this way. Not a fascist in the classic, you know, sense of Hitler and Mussolini. I hate freedom. You know, uh, you know, these are guys that are appealing to American traditions. Right. And I think believe them to some extent. Well, so there isn't a threat. And I think, as I might have mentioned either to you before the interview or during the interview, FDR is not running as somebody who's going to bring us a new deal in 1932. That's right. He makes contradictory statements, but he's making speeches that are to the right of Ronald Reagan in his calls for budget reductions and maintaining the gold standard, for example. But he is still the hero of liberals and even the socialist left. Even the socialist left puts FDR at the top of their list and they refer to him constantly. I want to tell you a story. Uh, do you know who Jimmy Dore is? He's a comedian who has a big show on the web now, the Jimmy Dore no, show. No, I don't. Anyway, no. he's sort of a he's sort of a dissident leftist. Um, but he and he's one of the last sort of left liberals who actually is in favor of free speech which he's, he's great about that. And he's always complaining about how the Democratic Party is squashing free speech through its control of social media, et cetera, et cetera. And just the other day, he had his piece about this and he was going on about how the Democratic Party now are totalitarian and they are censors and they want to stop us from speaking and thinking freely. And he says, and then he says, what we really need is to return to a president like Franklin Roosevelt. We need a we need a president like Franklin. We need Democrats like Franklin Roosevelt, because that's who that's who gave us freedom. And I then I, I tweeted about they did. I did a tweet storm about this in which I laid out Rose, some of some of Roosevelt's record with the First Amendment. But it turned out I was scratching the surface because someone said to me on, the, on Twitter, hey, did you know that David Beto's writing a book about FDR and civil liberties? I said, no. And I immediately emailed you. I said, what's going on, David? What's going on with this book? And tell me more about it. And you sent me the table of contents and the introduction. And this is going to be maybe the most explosive book you've written, which is saying something. Can you can you just tell us about what you found about Franklin Roosevelt and his his attitude and his policies vis-a-vis -vis the First Amendment? Well, 
uh, Roosevelt, as people tell half the story, when Roosevelt uh, uh, became president, that he's he's able to use radio effectively through fireside chats and that kind of thing, which is true. But he's able to uh, basically exert kind of both direct and indirect pressure, direct yeah. pressure sometimes through the FCC, but indirect pressure on um, using contributors in the party and so forth to force every single major anti-New Deal commentator off the air by 1938. And to the extent you have people that are critical, they tend to be on these smaller you know, stations and small networks and really can't reach a lot of people. So he's exerting pressure, very much so, through the arm of the state. Now, the print media is generally hostile to FDR, and he hates that. Hmm. There's a senator from Indiana who proposes a bill named Senator Mitten, and I think FDR put it up to him up to it. And Mitten is a key guy in the Senate. He's an assistant majority leader. He's the de facto majority leader, really. Um, and Minton says it proposes a bill that sounds a lot like a bill that Trump once supported. Everyone forgets that, where he says uh, he's going to make it a felony to print anything uh, that is shown to be false in a newspaper. And FDR, I think, puts him up to it. And FDR is asked about this bill at a news conference and jokes about it, says, well, we're going to run out of room in the federal prison sentence if we actually pass this bill. And I think he had to back off, though, because. This is what's different with today. One could say the Democratic Party is thoroughly corrupt in its commitment to free speech. Mm -hmm. One bright spot of this period was there were a lot of civil libertarian Democrats. Mm -hmm. A lot of people on the left that were pretty good on that issue. Mm -hmm. They were conflicted mm -hmm. um, and so forth. So FDR on the issue of civil liberties often faced opposition from these people. Subtle, right? Um, Japanese internment is an example. His, the leading people in his administration, including his attorney general, for God's sakes, Jagger Hoover, no leftist, uh, and Harold Ickes, a key New Dealer, they were all against the Japanese internment. And they pushed back and they made it difficult for FDR. And he didn't, you know, um, he got it. But not as much as maybe he could would have wanted. He didn't get internment of Japanese in Hawaii, which he wanted. But also FDR's civil liberties record, I think, was worse than Wilson's. Yeah. But there was a difference. There was less opposition to World War II. Right. And so after you had to really reach down because there's nobody against the war anymore. Even a lot of these guys that are prosecuted for sedition, they're supporting the war after Pearl Harbor. So you got to reach down. And FDR wanted to go against these people that opposed his pre-war policies, like a uh, uh, publisher of the Chicago Tribune, uh, Robert McCormick, or the publisher of the largest newspaper in the United States, uh, Joseph Patterson, the New York Daily News. Mm -hmm. He wants to prosecute these people, but his people in the Justice Department, the lower echelons are just, they, they no. Have we, and, and a lot of them had come out of World War I and had a negative take. FDR was one of the people who, still believed in going after people. So arguably, he has a worse civil rights record, civil liberties record, but there aren't as many people to prosecute. And um, there's opposition, but he does prosecute some. And one guy is this great guy that I came across who ran this paper in Boise, Idaho, Boise, Boise Valley. And it was this kind of this libertarian pacifist paper that was defending the Japanese Americans. It was anti-New Deal totally anti-racist. They published stuff by Bayard Rustin, for example, mm. out in the middle of Idaho. It's a community mm. newspaper. They were prosecuted. Went after the Socialist Workers Party, the Trotskyites, because they didn't go along with the war. That's right. But they, but these are people that were very common in World War I, so it made a lot of noise to prosecute them because there were a lot of them. There weren't many in World War II, so they even had to lower the bar. But again, even there, a lot of people in the Justice Department did not want to do these prosecutions mm. and pushed back. Mm. So this is a kind of story of people at the lower echelons pushing back mm. and FDR being the bad guy mm. <laughs> in terms of civil liberties. Mm. And uh, worse than Wilson, because at least Wilson's argument was, well, you know, if you want to prosecute these people, I guess you can do it. I'm not I'm not going to interfere with you like his, you know, attorney general and others. He just took the at laissez faire attitude in the sense, let him prosecute these people. I'm not going to really approve of it, but I'll, I'll let you. 
FDR instead is harassing his underling saying, why aren't you prosecuting this person? And why aren't you going after this person? Which I think makes him worse. Wow. <laughs> he just had a different environment he had to deal with. The most authoritarian president? Yes or no? Um, Lincoln. Yeah, Lincoln I would, would say the, Lincoln so. Would be the comp- Lincoln would be the top competitor, right? Oh, I think he's more authoritarian than Lincoln. Even than Lincoln. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the guy, na- I mean, quasi, you know, nationalizes much of the economy. That's right. And turns the Japanese Americans. Um, and uh, but but he faces more opposition than Lincoln. I mean, mm-hmm. Lincoln, you know, once the South leaves, he's got, you know, a party monopoly to a great extent. Um, um, he doesn't have to worry about the South anymore. FDR has to worry about people that'll push back against him all the way through. So there are limits on what he can do. The Supreme Court packing is a very good example of that. Yeah. And that is a, a very different people. Sometimes historians will portray that as the South fighting. No. Well, yeah, uh, some of them did. Some of them supported him, by the way, on court packing, like the most racist member of the U.S. House, uh, Representative Rankin supported court packing. I think Hugo Blacks did too, but there were a lot of people who were new dealers like Burton Wheeler, who is a a heroic figure, who's a very new deal progressive guy. Wheeler is sometimes I've seen him described as a isolationist Republican guy named Joseph McBride, who I kind of like his work. He writes on film describes and said, no, he wasn't. He was a Democrat. He was a new dealer. Um, he ran as the progressive party vice presidential candidate in 1932, but Wheeler has been smeared. He was smeared in that Philip Roth novel that was done a few years ago, some quasi fascist leader in, al- in an alternative America where the fascists take over. It's ridiculous. The guy was a tiger for civil liberties. He was against Japanese internment and he was defending civil liberties across the board for everyone. So Wheeler is, uh, I don't know who I'd compare him to. I'd say he's a, kind of like a Tulsi Gabbard, who's actually a powerful mm. figure in the Senate mm-hmm. um, in a way, um, um, or like a Glenn Greenwald. Um, but mm. again, you've got New Dealers that are against, I guess I'm getting around my point here, who push back against court packing, for example. And you don't see that now. I mean, maybe Christian Cinema, I don't know. But you don't see people break ranks like they did during this period. Right. And that's the discouraging part of of what you see now. Right. Yes. We're going to have a whole new understanding of FDR when this book comes out. And by the way, when does it come out? Uh, It comes out sometime next year. Okay. Do you have a title? It's called uh, FDR's War on the Bill of Rights. (laughs) And again, this is the the guy that gave us the four, you know, what, you know, the was it the the four four freedoms, five freedoms. Yeah, whatever. And, you know, it's all, you know, it's hypocrisy, but, you know. But people buy into that. So he's sort of seen as a civil libertarian hero to some for that reason. But he doesn't believe any of that stuff. Hey, man, I love talking to you about history because we see things so similarly. And it's just it's just a blast. I learned so much from you that I find incredibly useful. As I said, I mentioned your work just all the time. And because of that, uh, I think a lot of people listening will be excited to know that you and I are going to be teaching some courses at an unregistered academy probably on FDR and the New Deal, but also on the JFK assassination, which a lot of people are interested in. And there's, you said that there's a lot of interesting new work coming out about it. Can you just- A lot of interesting new work and we're not going to, in this course, going to endorse a conspiracy theory or endorse a lone nut theory. We're going to look at the most serious arguments on both sides. And these are people you probably haven't heard of. That's right. And I think it'll be fun. And I think you're going to have people participate in this course that are that though they disagree are just going to, are just going to have a blast with it. And this is the greatest murder mystery of the 20th century. And they're fun figures. I mean, God, it can't be figure like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jack Ruby. I mean, these are, these are great Oswald. um, And we're going to explore all that stuff. And uh, there's a lot of video and a lot of good audio. And I think we can kind of have a new take on it. Maybe I, Hey, you just pitched me this idea for a course just two hours ago, and I immediately said yes. So I can't wait for this. I can't wait to teach with I you. It's going to be great. Yeah. David Beto, uh, again, you are, without a doubt, the most underrated U.S. historian in the world. And I thank you for all of your work, and I thank you for coming on this show. Well, it's been a blast. Thanks for asking me. All right. I will see you in class. Okay. Goodbye. We'll be <laughs> okay. in touch. Great. Bye-bye. 
This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To become a patron of the show and have access to bonus episodes, AMAs, and the unreported news analysis show, go to patreon.com slash unregistered. Thanks for listening.